The purpose of this podcast is simple. We want you to get to know your doctor before meeting them in person because you're making a life-changing decision and time is scarce. The more you can learn about who your doctor is before you meet them, the better that first meeting will be. There is no substitute for an in-person appointment, but we hope this comes close. I'm your host, Eva Shea, and you're listening to Meet the Doctor. Hello, and thank you for listening to Meet the Doctor. I'm Eva Shea, and my guest today is Dr. Leslie Bender-Ralph, and she is a board-certified obstetrician and gynecologist in Tarpon Springs, Florida, which is Tampa. Do I have it right? Yeah, I'm in Tampa. Yeah, Tampa. Mm -hmm. But you're like closer to the water than, you're not like downtown Tampa, right? I'm really close to the airport. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Does that come in handy? I wish it did. (laughs) I wish I was able to fly out more often. But unfortunately, I'm not. But yeah. No, it just sits there telling you, you can't leave. Exactly. And I just look from (laughs) a distance. (laughs) So you're just at the beginning of having your own practice. So kind of tell us a little bit about what your days look like right now and your nights. Uh, Sometimes, usually my day starts at 9 a.m., except for those days. And you kind of gave a little bit of hint about that. I'm still doing obstetrics at night. So when I have a night call, I'll usually come into the office probably a little bit later around noon time and see patients until 5 p.m. But yeah, that's pretty much my day, how it goes. And so your patients are probably all women. Is that accurate? Well, for the most part, yes. But since I started doing hormone pellets, I've taken on some men, the partners of some of my female patients. Interesting. Yeah. Who would have thunk it, right? How does that happen? (laughs) The women are so happy that they drag their husbands in or do they not have to be dragged? Oh my goodness, Eva, you're so smart. You just said it. (laughs) Literally. (laughs) My women patients, they are so excited and happy that they're pretty much back to themselves again and how they remember things. And now the partner has to catch up. And so that's pretty much what brings the male in, their spouse. Do you think that we forget how we used to feel or is it sort of just back there? Like, I don't know that I remember (laughs) feeling great. (laughs) I'm just trying to call this up. You know, it's like you don't realize what you have until you no longer have it. And then you realize what's missing. And that's what I see. Patients come in and they'll say, I'm just so tired. I just feel exhausted. Or I'm at work and all of a sudden, I forget what I'm going to say. I have like this brain fog and it's so aggravating. What's going on with me? And all of these little things will add up, whether it's my connection with my partner is different now. I no longer have the desire or something's changed. And when you put all those symptoms together, they're like, it has to be something wrong. I just don't know what. And then they'll go and do their due diligence and say, wait, maybe it's a hormonal imbalance. And most of them are correct for the most part. I mean, you really can see it at all ages. How do they bring it up with you? Well, the most common reason they come in or complaint would be the intimacy between them and their partner. My husband says, you know, he's ready to go. He's ready to connect. And I'm just kind of exhausted and tired and lack that desire. And I want to have that desire and I want to have the energy. I want to be back the way I was before, but I'm noticing that I'm slowly kind of changing. How long have you been in your own office by yourself now? Oh, since May. So this is all that long. Yeah. Yeah. Since May, I've before been hospital employed where I was in practice, but this will be the first time with private practice, ground up, start up, practice of my own. So what pushed you over the cliff? I think I got to the point of where I just wanted to have my own autonomy, make my own uh, hours, of course, and just really treat patients in a, a setting where I didn't feel rushed. As we would say a concierge type setting where I could spend my time with patients, my Schedule wasn't over flooded with patients to where I felt like they were being rushed and they felt like they were being rushed and dissatisfied. 
this allows me to have time with them, to speak with them, to listen so they can be heard, their concerns. And it's a world of difference. I mean, they leave feeling like, okay, this is how it should be. I'm heard. Someone actually cares to stop, to listen, and I don't feel like I'm on the clock, like I'm being rushed. So I think it's the way medicine should be. In your old world, how long was a typical appointment? And then how long is it now in in your own world? So before, I remember the time, even when I would have 35 to 40 patients on my schedule. In one day? In one day. Now, half of those would be OB patients, which usually tend to be quicker visits with the GYN patients taking a little bit longer. But just the way our medical system is made up, I mean, there's such a demand and you want to help everyone. But then when you try to help everyone, you realize the time that you have to spend to actually help them keeps decreasing because you want to get them in, you want to see them, and you don't want them to have long waits until they get an appointment. But here now, I feel like I'm able to see a patient, one patient, 30 minutes to an hour. And yes, and it feels good to me. I don't feel rushed. It feels great to the patient. We talk about their concerns. We discuss their family. I feel like I really get to know them and they get to know me. Do they start looking at their watch like, don't you have to be somewhere, Dr. Bender? Like, no, What they are you don't. doing here? This they, is don't. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. They feel so relaxed. And I feel like they think it could go on even longer. It's just amazing what you can hear from patients and their experiences with previous offices and how now they just kind of feel like they have that time. Did you ever do or do you still do a high-risk pregnancy? Yeah. When I do my labor shifts, they're all high risk. So pretty much everything that gets funneled through the Tampa Bay area comes to our hospital in Tampa. (laughs) So it gets extremely, extremely high risk. Yes. Yeah. I was really old when I had mine. So I know what that channel looks like. There's only one. (laughs) Yeah. And you're all there together. Oh, hey, old lady. How are you doing? (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah, I always thought that was so funny. I'd look around like, does she look older than me? Oh, no. Well, you know, the age when women are having children now, it's getting up there more and more now. You know, I'm noticing 44-year-olds, 45-year-olds. And we always said advanced maternal age started at 35, but there's even been discussions of pushing it even a little bit further back because it's more- is the new 35. Yeah, (laughs) it's getting more common now, uh, for sure. Yeah. Yep. I did my second one at 44 and it, everything was fine. Well, thank so, God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Praise the Lord. How did you end up in women's health in the first place? I felt comfortable when I rotated through the other specialties and other fields of medicine. Once I landed on OB, it just made sense to me. You know, being able to empower women and help bring life into the world, it's just its just a feeling like none other. <laughs> just feels really good. Do you think you'll keep delivering babies indefinitely? Like, is there a world where you're like, I don't want to do that anymore? Mm-hmm. Or just during the day? <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know. My, um, my mom, she's so funny. She asked me the same question. And I kind of ventured off to really focus on gynecology and cosmetics. And she goes, I hope you're going to still bring babies into the world, right? Because that's what you trained for, right? Mm-hmm. And I told her, I said, uh, I think so. But if I'm out of my reproductive years. And now I feel like I'm kind of following my patients now to the next stage of life, whether it's hormones and trying to get into anti-aging and age reversal techniques, procedures. So I feel like I'm just kind of growing along with my patients. Makes sense. Yeah. This is like the next stage. We all, I think, want to benefit from your experience. I say this as a person who always chooses old doctors because I know. (laughs) They've been around. (laughs) They know stuff. Right, right. No, that's true. So in the future, I mean, there's a ton of advancements happening both in hormones and in weight loss. Mm -hmm. How are you thinking about that? And what does that look like 
for your patients? I think that weight loss is such a a big factor when it comes to, especially with hormonal imbalances. That's also a common complaint. Women will come in and and state, not only am I feeling the you know anxiety or fatigue or lack of focus, I also feel like I just can't lose weight. And I feel like it's really a blessing that the GLP ones have became so popular. I mean, every medication has risk, and you have to really weigh the benefits versus the risks and how, you know, take into card the patient's medical history and whether or not they're a good candidate. But, you know, it's really made weight loss achievable for a lot of patients. And we're taught now to really see obesity and as more of a condition versus the individual has just doesn't have the willpower to stop or control what they eat. And when we see it more as a a disease or a disorder, like we see hypertension, then we tend to be more aggressive with the treatment because we know it can lead to cardiovascular disease and other issues down the down the road for the patient. Why is it so hard to lose weight at that sort of middle age? What is going on in the body that makes it so difficult? It's estrogen. <laughs> it is. You know, estrogen is supposed to be our fat burner. <laughs> and we see that start to decline. I mean, it doesn't happen abruptly because the ovaries are still able to produce, but at the same time, there's a slow decline. And we see that because that's such a common symptom for perimenopausal women or women who have hormonal imbalances. It's very common. I can just think of our polycystic ovarian syndrome patients who have those hormonal imbalances and obesity usually accompanies it. And so hormones play a big part of this. I assume when you see somebody for the first time, you're, the very first thing you do is labs, right? Like. So, right, exactly. You want to have a baseline for sure. When you're dealing with weight loss and even hormones, you want to see where their baseline is. And when it comes to, of course, the GLPs, you know, I'm looking at the liver, the pancreas, all of those labs just to get a baseline of where they are and to see if they are a candidate. And on the hormone replacement side of it, I'm getting labs to see, you know, where their testosterone, where's their estradiol, What is their sex hormone binding level? Where is their, um, it's just so many different things we look for to determine, is this patient deficient of one of those or do they have an imbalance? So how often do you have your patients doing both hormone replacement and a GLP-1? Is that pretty common now? It is. It really is. But I'll usually let a patient try their hormone replacement therapy first because sometimes they feel like, you know, and they couldn't be right some of the time that if they replace their hormones and they get them optimized, then they will have the energy to go to the gym. They will have the energy to do those things that can help facilitate in their weight loss. And sometimes they'll get their hormones optimized and they'll have the energy and they'll say, I'm going to the gym, but nothing's happening. And that's really when your GLPs kind of kick in and can help facilitate and help them reach their goals. So how often do they come back and check in with you? Are they there every month, every three months? What does that look like? So after the hormones, when they come in, I'll usually have them come back after two weeks to just review the labs and go over their options. And then after that, just depending on which route of hormones they would like to proceed with, whether it's the pellets, the injections, the pills, the creams, usually they come back in a month. And then we kind of see what needs to be tweaked. But they're always welcome to come back prior to that time if they're having any issues or feel like, I just can't wait till a month. Like, this is just not it. This is not working until we get it right. Is there a favorite that you have in there? Like, is the pellet better than the injection or does it just depend on the person? It depends on the person. But I have to say my favorite is pellets. Pellets. I, yeah, I would have to say my favorite is the pellets just because it's so convenient. And I think patients like that too. And with the pellets, it tends to mimic their hormones and how the way, the way their body would actually produce them. So it's just a better route. 
Now, can men handle the pellets as well as women, or are women tougher in this scenario here? I think you know the answer. <laughs> you know I do. That's why I'm asking. So about uh, 10 years ago, we used to hang out with it. We had a strong friend group. Mm-hmm. And one of the guys in this group showed up at trivia. Uh-huh. And he was like, I had a procedure today. And I was like, okay, whatever, dude. And <laughs> half an hour later, he brought it up again. He was like, I'm in a little bit of pain. I said, what did you do? And he said, I had a testosterone pellet, please. <laughs> Like, are you serious? Right. You're giving me this much drama over a pellet? Right. Yeah. It's like a, a major surgery. <laughs> For a man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, but yeah, women tend to be able to handle pretty much anything. I feel like yeah. like a walk in the park. <laughs> yes, you know we can. And you see it every day. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes you look back on the stuff you handled and wonder, how did you do that? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. That's one of the great things about getting older, I think, is looking backward on the things you did. Yeah. Just reflecting. Like you're going to look back on starting your own practice and you're not going to remember how hard it was someday. I hope not because now it's so much work. But I, you know, I enjoy it. I enjoy coming to work every day and I enjoy seeing my patients and um, that in itself is rewarding. How are patients finding you? So I have marketing, a marketing team that's really great. You know, I have ads, Google, Facebook, Instagram. I think the biggest is word of mouth. That's been really great. See someone, a patient, they're satisfied and They want to go tell their friends. So that one really is straight to my heart. Go straight to my heart. That's the best way. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So give us an overview of all the services that you have on the aesthetic side. On the aesthetic side, I offer liposuction, body tight, which is one of the devices by InMode. Really does well in conjunction with the liposuction for skin tightening. I also do PDO threads or thread lifts. I do Botox, PRP, microneedling. Is there anything where you're combining your gynecological background with aesthetics? Do you do any feminine rejuvenation down there? Yes, that is in the making. Yes, (laughs) with vaginal rejuvenation. I also do labiaplasty. I think that's only natural. I said, I've repaired so many different, <laughs> after deliveries, where there's the vagina, the labia, just kind of comes as the next natural thing I should be doing is labiaplasty. Okay. So still delivering babies, helping women with hormones, weight loss, some aesthetics, probably growing on the aesthetic side as you get going. Who is on your team? Who might we meet when we come to see you before we get in the room with you? So I have an excellent surgical tech that I kind of have borrowed from a hospital who is excellent. And she comes and, and gives me a helping hand when needed. And so far, just her and I. That's good. You have to have the right people too. You can't just put anybody in there. When you're trying to take good care of people, that's just as important. Oh, for sure. We've worked together for many years and she knows my flow. I know her flow. And so it just works. Mm -hmm. The best surgical techs are like third arms, third and fourth arms, aren't they? Oh, yeah. I mean, before I call the instrument, she already knows what I'm going to call. It's natural. (laughs) Give us a little flavor of what you like to do outside of work now that you're not, well, maybe you're working more than you were before. I don't know. Yeah, I eventually, hopefully, it'll be <laughs> more time, more free time. But I enjoy my husband and my three kids, Leah, Liam, and Jordan. They keep me pretty busy, but since school has started, I feel like I come from the office to straight home, to doing homework, taking a shower, and going to sleep. <laughs> and isn't it annoying that they all have to eat every single day? It's like so much work. Oh, don't remind me of that. Yeah. 
for like you just ate the yesterday. Most thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, how can we not have leftovers? I just don't get it. Do I have to cook every day? <laughs> it is the one thing that everyone in the world has in common that no one has solved for. And you just can't eat out every day. I guess you can. I know one doctor who finally hired a chef. Oh, nice. Fancy. Nice. No, for now, I just have Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. And my kids do not get tired of it. <laughs> what about Sunday? Yeah, no, Sunday, Sunday is not so bad. So usually on Saturdays, I'm able to prep something. Like usually season a baked chicken and get it ready. So that way on Sunday after church, just come home, pop it in the oven and have a nice meal that'll last for Sunday and maybe Monday. But yeah, the rest of the week is just so hard. You still do Sunday dinner with the whole family and sit down? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. We look forward to that. The best. We like to go for barbecue because we live in Austin and there's a lot of meat around. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) And I'm sure since that's Texas, it's really legit barbecue. Most of the time, yeah. Even the bad barbecue is pretty good. It's still kind of a bad barbecue is good barbecue to me. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. If someone is listening or uh, watching today and they want to find out more about you, where should they go look for more information? My website is www.gsatampa.com. I'll make sure we put it in the show notes. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for telling your story to us today. I'm so glad to meet you. Oh, so nice meeting you too. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. If you're considering making an appointment or are on your way to meet this doctor, be sure to let them know you heard them on the Meet the Doctor podcast. Check the show notes for links, including the doctor's website and Instagram to learn more. Are you a doctor or do you know a doctor who'd like to be on the Meet the Doctor podcast? Book your free recording session at meetthedoctorpodcast.com. Meet the Doctor is made with love in Austin, Texas, and is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.